and said to them, His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May be seated. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. You recall that. 
All the blessedness of not living that way, not walking that way. It, it's an exclamation. It's not a promise about your happiness. I'm really very disturbed by the people who put such an emphasis on their personal happiness and satisfaction as if that is why Jesus came to die. He didn't come for you and your happiness. Well, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if you heard, but Kathy and I are splitting up. Why? I'm just not happy anymore. <laughs> well, boo-hoo. <laughs> Suck it up and stay. <laughs> your personal happiness is not the measurement of what you're supposed to be doing and being. I quit my job. <coughs> Why? I'm just not happy. Well, do you have another job? No. <laughs> I'm just going to leave the Lord's number. You need to go back to your job. <laughs> it's not about your happiness. Don't, don't misread this. this. This is not happy are, happy are, happy are the people. And, oh, good. I can find out how to be happy. All, all the blessedness of this kind of attitude, this kind of state, all the blessedness of poverty of spirit, of mourning, of meekness, of hungering and thirsting, of the merciful, of the pure in heart, of the peacemakers, of the persecuted. In Greek, there are two words for poor. Penes describes a day laborer, a minimum wage working person who doesn't have much, they have some, but they'd be described as poor because they don't have excess, they don't have lots of stuff. That's one word for poor in the Greek. <coughs> then there's, there, there's another word, patakas, which describes the truly destitute person, the person in abject poverty. And here in our text, Matthew 5, 3, the second word is used. All the blessedness of the person who in his or her spirit is in abject poverty. All the blessedness of the person who realizes how destitute they are. All the blessedness of a person who realizes how bankrupt he or she is. Remember the Laodiceans with which I opened the sermon? Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. They thought of themselves as wealthy, and actually they were poor. What is called for here in this text, blessed are the poor in spirit, is poverty. Now, the text is not celebrating material poverty. We'll always have the poor with us. That's said later in Matthew 26, 11. But actually, the gospel is to help alleviate poverty. We are to proclaim good news to the poor. We are to present to all who are broken and wounded, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by his own life and presence in one's life actually makes the poor rich. Yes. Yes. This text is not celebrating material poverty. If you're right there in Matthew, just go to chapter 11. Let me remind you of a passage. I want to begin at verse 1 of Matthew 11, just a couple pages to your right if you're using a print Bible, one swipe if you're using an electronic device. <laughs> now it came to pass when Jesus finished, this is Matthew 11, 1, finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in other cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, now listen to this, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, 
and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, this passage is not saying blessed are the poor, those in abject material poverty. In fact, the gospel comes to address that. You tell John that the gospel is doing its job. The gospel is addressing the poor and addressing poverty itself. Luke's version of the Beatitudes is found in Luke 6, 20. Luke says, blessed are the poor. Matthew gives us a little more specificity. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The poverty spoken of here is poverty of spirit. And of course, you can use the word poor in several different ways, can't you? You can say, I uh, played the piano poorly, or uh, he did a poor job of this or that. I heard about a preacher, let's call him Reverend Fortson. Reverend Fortson was asked to make a sizable donation to the American way, or to the United Way, rather. And he said to the rep from the United Way, you're asking for a very large sum of money, and I'm a poor preacher. The United Way rep said, yes, I know, I've heard you preach. <laughs> <laughs> no, this doesn't refer to doing one's craft poorly, applying one's craft poorly, doing one's work poorly. This talks about poverty of spirit. So what does that mean? Let me suggest that when we get to the point where we are broken and contrite and at the end of ourselves, we are in the right spot for God to do his work. That's what this means. When you are bankrupt in your inner person and realize you can't fix yourself. All the blessedness of coming to the reality of your poverty of spirit. That's what this passage is about. There are two passages in the book of Isaiah to which I will point you. I'll read one of them in the interest of time, but if you're taking notes, take both of them down. Isaiah 50, well they're, they're short. I think I will read both of them. 57, 15 of the prophecy of Isaiah. Very helpful for my understanding, your understanding of this Matthew 5, 3, first beatitude. Isaiah 57, 15, I'll just read that one verse. For thus says the high and lofty one, that's God, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You hear it? I'm really ministering to those who have come to their own sense of contrition, their brokenness, their neediness, their bankruptcy, their poverty. I've come for them. And I'm near to the brokenhearted. Now turn to 66, 1 and 2 of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. The folks at Laodicea were proud of all that they had accomplished, and they were arrogant and haughty. God is not nearer to those folks. He's near to the broken. He is near to the wounded. He's near to the one who knows that he or she has nothing they can bring to the table when dealing with God. All the blessedness of being poor and knowing you're poor in the spirit. Do you remember the way Jesus introduces the parable of the Pharisee, the proud Pharisee, 
and the poor tax collector. Do you remember that story? Only Luke tells the story. It's a parable found in Luke 18. <coughs> and read it later on. But the way Jesus introduces the parable is wonderful. I, I won't read the parable in the interest of time. You read it a little later, perhaps. But I, I want to just read the way Jesus introduces it. Then he spoke a parable. Actually, it's in verse 9. He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Then he tells the parable. He spoke this parable to those who were not poor in spirit. They prided themselves on their righteousness. Arrogant, self-sufficient, are disqualified actually from the kingdom of heaven. All the blessedness of realizing your poverty, for when you realize it, then heaven is yours. So note with me three things and then I'm done. Note with me this voluntary posture, poverty. One puts oneself into this posture. There's one stanza of Augustus Toplady's wonderful classic hymn called Rock of Ages. And one of the stanzas says, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, lest I die. Uh, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. That's the person who's poor in spirit. Not bragging, I don't brag, but I've done a lot of good work for the church. You know, God also blessed me. All that I've done for his people. Well, you take your cockiness, your tilting head, and take it to the cross. And humble yourself in front of that cross. Nothing in your hand could you bring. All the blessedness of realizing how little I have. All the blessedness of realizing how empty and bankrupt I am in spirit. For it is only out of that bankruptcy and out of that realization I may come to inherit the king. Wow. Winston Churchill, whom I really enjoy. I, I read regularly. Uh, the quotes from Winston Churchill. He was in an elevator one time. He was in a lift in Great Britain, as they'd say. And he was drunk. And a woman with whom he had a running feud said to him, Sir Winston, you're drunk! And he said, yes. And you're ugly. <laughs> but in the morning, I'll be sober. <laughs> yeah, get that one out. <laughs> that was an aside. Had nothing to do with this. <laughs> Sir Winston was asked. Doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? And he replied, it's quite flattering. But whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. <laughs> he was humbled. He knew he wasn't all that. He knew that the same people who applaud you could hang you. Amen. Without even thinking about it. One puts oneself in this posture of non-proud behavior and non-arrogant status. One puts oneself in poverty, voluntarily, poverty of spirit. And one ever comes to God 
with hands and heart and life wide open so that he may give you the key. Note with me, secondly, not only this voluntary posture, but a Christ-given promise. When we follow Jesus, we become kingdom people. You know what I mean by that? We submit ourselves to the reign of God. And everyone who submits to the reign of God is called a citizen of the kingdom. We call ourselves kingdom people, and kingdom people are distinct from other people, from people who don't follow Jesus. John Stott, beloved pastor, theologian, Bible expositor, 1921 to 2011. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Stott, wonderful, humble man. In his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, the Sermon on the Mount, he says that the key passage for understanding the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 6, 8. Matthew 6, 8 simply says, do not be like them. Talks about Pharisees, Jesus talks about Pharisees and Gentiles and people who don't, don't walk with God, don't buy into the kingdom of God, and he says, you shouldn't be like them. Now let that one phrase, do not be like them, inform the life you live, kingdom people can't be like other people. Amen. Saints can't afford to go around acting like ants. <laughs> Saints are supposed to be different. Yes. In everything we do, do not be like them. Remember in 1 Samuel 8, Israel said to the prophet, we want a king just like all the other nations have. We want to be like them. We want a king like everybody else has. We want a monarchy. They were living under a theocracy. God was their king. But they wanted a king like the other people. I hear Jesus saying to them, do not be like them. You don't have to be like them. I had told you, I'm sure, since some months ago now, so the quote bears repeating, but I heard about a young lady who was in high school, and she was a virgin. And all her friends were making fun of her saying all kinds of things to her. Come on, we've all had a little taste of the forbidden fruit. Come on, why don't you, you know, come on, cooperate with him, that guy, you know, come on. She, absolutely committed to Jesus Christ as Savior. She, a kingdom young lady, said to them, this is a great line, she said to them, and she wagged her finger in the face of her jeering girlfriend. She said, I could be like you any time, but you can never again be like me. <laughs> Do not be like them, Jesus is saying. Here is this promise. You who are contrite in spirit, broken in spirit, bankrupt in spirit, Poor in spirit, in abject poverty in spirit, receive the kingdom of heaven. Here's the promise. As you walk with me, that which is unavailable to those who don't walk with me is yours. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. And he opens up this entire other world to them. Quote John Stott again. Right at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount, Stott says, Jesus contradicted all human judgments and all nationalistic expectations of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is given to the poor, not the rich. The feeble, not the mighty. To little children humble enough to accept it, not to soldiers who boast that they obtain by their own prowess. Poor in spirit. A terrible posture? No, not at all. This is the most positive form of poverty there is. Yes. We empty ourselves that Christ might fill us. And we deliberately become poor in spirit. 
that Christ might make us rich by his own kingdom. As I close this message, I want you to hear how some versions of the Bible have rendered Matthew 5, 3. Bless other poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. From the International Children's Bible, those people who know they have great spiritual needs are happy. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. The J.D. Phillips, New Testament. How happy are the humble-minded, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The Good News Translation. Happy are those who know they're spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. The easy-to-read version, the ERV. Great blessings belong to those who know they're spiritually in need. God's kingdom belongs to them. And the rather unique Eugene Peterson in the message. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. The kingdom people. Well, let me give you a third note. Note with me an unexpected payoff. I know one of the questions we ask when we read the Bible, if we read it at all, is what's in it for me? Not sure that's the best question to be asking. But let's, let's suppose you ask. I'll tell you what, what you get. You get an extraordinary dose of God's grace lavished upon you. That's the way to get that. Glad you asked. James chapter 4, verse 8, which quotes, by the way, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. Here's what James says, quoting Proverbs. God resists the proud, the rich in spirit, but gives grace to the humble. Did you hear? God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. To the person who voluntarily puts him or herself in poverty of spirit. To that person, God gives an extraordinary measure of grace. While no one volunteers for negative, abject poverty in this economy, may there be a long line of us who volunteer to humble ourselves and to present to God our broken, contrite hearts. Now that kind of poverty is oh so positive. Let us pray. We pray, O oh God, that you would break our proud hearts. That we in brokenness and contrition might come before you. We confess that we have been too proud for our own good and have boasted and bragged about our accomplishments which would not have been possible at all, apart from thy grace. We seek to be poor in spirit this day, and pray that you would help us as we posture ourselves before thee. May we be not ashamed to bow the head and the heart and the knee and the life to you. For thou art the high and lofty and holy one, and we are humble and poor and wretched. In thee, as we abide in you, we are strong. In thee and only in thee are we rich and capable and mighty. 
teach us to see ourselves as poor that you might enrich us, that you might work on us. It is our prayer in the name of him who became poor that we might become rich. In the name of him who had all power in his hands and yet deliberately came in weakness that we might pick up on his model. In the name of him who had many options but who came as a servant and humbled himself to death. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And the people said, Amen. Amen. <coughs> For the reception, I don't think we see Indra yet, but I'm sure she'll come. I told her we'd be out about 1240. I think she was going to come just at the end of our celebration. <coughs> Would you please hold up and receive the blessing? Huh? I'm sorry, let's sing first. <laughs> let's sing our closing hymn and then our blessing.
<laughs> positively or in spirit that God might make you rich. Go from this place with your broken hearts and your broken spirits and may God renew you in a way you could not renew yourself. Go from this place and may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. The Lord cause his countenance to rise upon you. And the Lord be gracious to you. In all your comings and all your goings, may you know the richness of our Savior in your life. In all that you do and in all that you say, may the light of Jesus Christ be seen in you. Go from this place. Christ ever going before you and being the difference in you. Amen.